Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our two videos on drugs and hypertension. Uh, this is part two. The drugs I'm going to go over here, uh, while they are very commonly used, uh, they're a little bit less commonly used for hypertension itself. They have other common uses, uh, but these generally are not the first drugs we go to for a patient who just has hypertension. So just bear that in mind. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you will get notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, so we're going to start with the sympatholytics here. Remember in the previous video, uh, which you should have already watched, uh, I talked about diuretics and I talked about the RAS inhibiting agents, which remember are ACE inhibitors and ARBs and so forth. Um, so that is in video one. Go back and watch that if you haven't already. So we're going to talk about sympatholytics here to start out here, and uh, we're gonna talk about the beta blockers and alpha-1 blockers. Beta blockers, so this includes metoprolol, atenolol, those two are probably the most commonly used for hypertension, and then we also have propranolol and labetalol, and I'll go into uh, how those drugs are used. The mechanism, there are actually several mechanisms uh, by which these beta blockers work, and that makes sense because beta receptors are all over the body. So. Uh, number one and number two, they have negative chronotropic and negative inotropic effects. That means that uh, the, uh, the ejection fraction will go down a little bit and the heart will slow. And together, that's going to reduce the cardiac output. Uh, number three, they reduce renin release. So in some way, it has some slight similarities to those RAS agents, but you can absolutely uh, use a beta blocker and a RAS agent at the same time if you need to. So these beta blockers are not routinely used for the management of hypertension. Um, they're used for patients with hypertension with certain comorbidities, namely heart disease, okay? So you got a patient who's post-MI, you would use a beta blocker, um, can both uh, increase their cardiovascular uh, survival, uh, and it also manages the hypertension. So uh, if you just have an ordinary patient with no comor comorbidities and you have to start them on a drug, you're usually gonna go with a thiazide or maybe an ACE inhibitor, not a beta blocker. Uh, it can also be used in certain arrhythmias like supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, propranolol is often used in essential tremor and in performance anxiety. So keep that in your back pocket. Obviously nothing to do with hypertension, but it is a, commonly, uh, a, a common reason to prescribe these drugs, propranolol in particular. Uh, and this, these are very common things you run into, so uh, you'll want to know that. Labetalol is used in hypertensive emergencies. If you don't know what that is, go back to my hypertension videos. Um, and also for hypertension in pregnancy. So gestational hypertension or hypertension related to preeclampsia. Adverse effects here, these are beta blockers. Remember, you have beta-2 receptors uh, on your smooth uh, muscle in your airways. Uh, so the consequence from that is that it can worsen asthma and or COPD. So we want to avoid beta blockers in those patients. Bronchospasm is an adverse effect. Other things are fatigue and even lipid disturbances. Uh, also, this is so important. Do not use beta blockers first to lower blood pressure in patients with suspected pheochromocytoma. So if you have a 24-year-old woman coming in, never been diagnosed with hypertension before, she's got intermittent panic attacks, sweating, um, you know, comes and goes every so often, you are not going to go for a beta blocker first. You first want to evaluate her for a pheochromocytoma and then uh, if she does not have a pheochromocytoma, you can give a beta blocker if you want. It's not the best drug to go for. Uh, but if you do have a patient with a pheochromocytoma, it's alpha blockade first, then beta blockade, then surgery. Okay, so speaking of the alpha blockers, there's a number of them. Prazosin, doxazosin, terazosin, and then these uh, irreversible ones, fentolamine and phenoxybenzamine, which have really good use for pheochromocytoma. 
The mechanism here is to reduce the SVR. So we're reducing vascular resistance and that therefore has an effect on lowering blood pressure. Remember blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. If we lower this, we lower this. Um, so this is used to lower blood pressure in patients where you suspect a pheochromocytoma is the first drug you go for. And then it also has a use in BPH. So men who have difficulty urinating, you know, maybe they're 55, 60, 65 years old, um, check their prostate. If it's enlarged, you can go for one of these drugs. The adverse effect here is orthostatic hypotension because you're reducing the vascular resistance and that can therefore lead to syncope. I would also add that prazosin has a really nice clinical usage in managing nightmares in patients with a history of PTSD. So that is a good uh, application of this drug, of course, completely unrelated to hypertension. There are really no significant contraindications for alpha blockers, just use your clinical judgment. Okay, this is one that trips a lot of people up, the good old calcium channel blockers. So there are two classes of calcium channel blockers and that confuses people. So the four most commonly used calcium channel blockers are verapamil, diltiazem, nifedipine, and amlodipine. So those first two drugs, verapamil and diltiazem, these are not used for hypertension. These are cardioselective. So you have calcium channels all over, uh, but Specifically here, you have them on your heart and you have them on your vasculature. The non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers are more cardioselective. Um, so they are used as antiarrhythmics and they are also used for variant angina. What is that? That's Prinz Metals angina. So think of a 25-year-old coming in with angina, um, you know, pristine coronary arteries. Um, they have vasospasm. And uh, so this is pretty good to use for that. Now, what we use for hypertension is the vasoselective calcium channel blockers, also called dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Um, so you can use this for hypertension. You can use it for stable angina. You can use it for esophageal spasm. These are more vasoselective, so they're not going to have that cardiac depressant effect that you would have in ver verapamil or diltiazem. Um, the way I like to remember it is dihydropyridine ends in dean, and all the drugs that are dihydropyridines end in dipine. Kind of so sounds the same. Adverse effect here is arrhythmia with the non-dihydropyridines. Remember, these are more cardioselective. And uh, then syncope, constipation, because we're working on smooth muscle here and your gut is lined with smooth muscle, so it can slow everything down there. Peripheral edema and gingival overgrowth. I have no idea why that happens. Nitrates. So nitrates, again, are very commonly used, really not so much for the outpatient management of hypertension. When we give these drugs to outpatients, we're generally giving it for angina. However, there is one drug, nitroprusside, that does have use in the inpatient setting for hypertension. The mechanism here is pretty complex. Uh, so with these drugs, uh, they all cause increased availability of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide activates guanyl cyclase. That increases cyclic GMP. And th there's a few more steps there. Ultimately, it leads to smooth muscle relaxation. Now, just as an aside here, cyclic GMP is broken down, well, just whatever you want to call it. I don't know what the metabolite is. It's broken down by an enzyme called phosphodiesterase 5. What do you know about phosphodiesterase 5? It is inhibited by drugs like sildenafil, sildenafil, or tadalafil. Okay, those are drugs that are used for erectile dysfunction. Okay, so they work very similarly. Um, and so for that reason, it is very, very, very important that you never combine nitrates with a PDE5 inhibitor. You will drop your patient's blood pressure like a rock. So one or the other, not both. Now, nitroprusside is a little bit different. So whereas nitroglycerin, isosorbide, they are organic nitrates. Nitroprusside directly donates 
nitric oxide. And so it works very, very quickly. It is very, very potent. And so we can use this in a hypertensive emergency. And that's really the only reason we would give nitroprusside. Um, so the rest of the drugs, nitroglycerin, isosorbide dinitrate, and there are some others, um, they are mainly anti-anginal drugs, not anti-hypertensives. The adverse effects pretty much pertain to hypotension. Uh, you can get a pretty severe hypotension from these. And there are a couple others, cyanide poisoning. And that's only from nitroprusside, SNP sodium nitroprusside. Why does that happen? Well, here's sodium nitroprusside. Look here, 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 here. Those are all uh, cyanide groups. And so when this gets metabolized, uh, you will have cyanide. Ordinarily, the amount of nitroprusside we give is fine, but if you give a lot of nitroprusside, um, you can precipitate cyanide poisoning. So be careful. Methemoglobinemia in all of these is an adverse effect. Um, and then headaches and dizziness. Um, why headaches? Because you cause vasodilation. Vasodilation causes headaches. Okay, that's a very important principle. One of the reasons that caffeine is useful for the treatment of headaches is that it's a vasoconstrictor. Migraines are very, very similar in that you have vasospasm. So if we can constrict those vessels, we can abort the migraine. So anything that dilates vessels can trigger a migraine, even in a person who does not have migraines ordinarily. Now, don't confuse nitrates with nitrites, like amyl nitrite. Those drugs have historically been used as an, as an emergency antidote for cyanide poisoning. All right, so uh, I just want to point out, though, that amyl nitrite is not used anymore for cyanide poisoning. What do we use? Large doses of vitamin B12, cobalamin. Um, I think it's only a few micrograms that you need in, uh, in a day to uh, keep up your vitamin B12 stores, we give several grams in cyanide poisoning. So quite a different dose. All right, now I'll just finish up treating hypertension in the pregnant patient. So anytime a patient is pregnant and has hypertension, you should be thinking of a variety of things, particularly if she's after 20 weeks. So gestational hypertension, that's just isolated hypertension of pregnancy. Preeclampsia, where you have hypertension and proteinuria, and it needs to be two plus proteinuria. Severe preeclampsia, where they have preeclampsia with severe hypertension, like going over 160 uh, systolic. Um, or they have neurologic symptoms, things like headache, visual disturbances, abdominal pain. That's not neurological, but there are a number of symptoms that characterize severe preeclampsia. And then eclampsia, which is where you have a preeclampsia and then you develop a seizure. And then HELP syndrome, which is a variant of preeclampsia in which you also have hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Don't you just love it when the mnemonic is in the name of the uh, disease? Now, the treatment of choice for hypertension in the pregnant patient is generally labetalol orally. Uh, you can also use hydralazine or alpha-methyldopa. Those are also commonly used, but I would go with labetalol for uh, your exam. Do not use diuretics or RAS inhibiting drugs. As I said in the previous video, for hypertension and pregnancy, those are always the wrong answer.